The girl sat in the passenger seat of her car, freezing her ass off. She was really starting to get worried. Billy! She finally called out. Billy, this isn't funny. I'm scared. But there was no answer. But then she heard this scratching on the roof of her car. Small at first, but it grew and grew like a feral animal trying to get in. She covered her ears and screamed, hoping it would go away. And when the screaming stopped, she couldn't hear it anymore. Knowing she wouldn't be able to go anywhere without the keys, she got out of the car to find Billy. And what she saw caused her hair to go white with fright. There, on the roof of the car, was Billy's stolen surplus labor. Yeah, 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 I know. This time you've gone too far. But honestly, most horror has at the root of it a question about the allocation of resources. Think about it. Part of the reason everyone was so suspicious of Dracula and the novel was he was a foreigner buying up expensive land in the middle of town. And if Frankenstein's reanimation scheme was a hit, who do you think would have control over that? Are we bringing back a homeless veteran who froze in the streets? No. We're getting four more years of zombie Reagan. Like it or not, resources are a form of power. Lack of power leads to feelings of helplessness. And helplessness is the mother's milk of horror. If you don't believe me, go watch Amityville again. Not any of the sequels, the remake, or that weird-ass Amity Manson family values whatever the f I'm talking about the original. If you saw it when you were a kid, you probably were scared by the glowing eyes or the idea that a window was going to smash your little fingers. You know what scares adults watching that movie? It's when he can't find the money to pay the caterer. That will mess you up for the rest of the week, or at least until your next paycheck. None of this is to say that every screenwriter who sits down to write a draft thinks about the material conditions or what a Marxist analysis of the text might say, but they do try to make their characters as believable and relatable as possible, even if the plot details are extraordinary. And that usually means considering what kind of job they have, whether they're rich or poor, and what kind of struggles the audience might relate to. And so it is with John Baird, the screenwriter of 1981's My Bloody Valentine, and George Mahalka, the director. After the success of Friday the 13th, Paramount Pictures essentially told Mahalka that they would guarantee him a wide release on 1,200 screens if he could deliver a slasher movie by Valentine's Day. So Mahalka and Baird rushed into production in the fall of 1980, shooting on location in Nova Scotia with Sidney Mines standing in for Valentine Bluffs. While the filmmakers were working on post-production, John Lennon was shot in December 1980, prompting a worldwide outcry against violence in media. Long story short, Mahalka and crew's hard work ironically got chopped to bits, with a full nine minutes of gore and extra scenes cut from the film before its release. The constant battle with the MPAA also meant that the film barely came in under the wire for Paramount's schedule. So in this case, Paramount's edict of turning an R-rated movie in on time dictated the end result of Mahalka's artistic expression. See, you're already doing a Marxism. Anyway, the film was considered to be a big disappointment, but not an outright flop. It made its money back, but just barely, and Paramount had no interest in turning it into a second franchise. They already had their golden goose, and to twist the knife even further, not only did they not create a Canadian slasher series, they had the killer in the series they did support wear a hockey mask. Go figure. My Bloody Valentine made the rounds on cable in the mid-1980s, before drifting into obscurity until the early 2000s when DVD became a thing, and golden boy of obscure cinema Quentin Tarantino proclaimed this to be his favorite slasher movie. To coincide with the 3D remake that was released in 2009, filmmakers began the arduous task of trying to find and restore the nine minutes of deleted footage. And the results were a film that more resembles the actual slasher that Mahalka made and less the Canadian soap opera it became. Obviously, we're mining for spoilers here, so if you haven't seen it, be forewarned. And feel free to tell us your favorite holiday slasher in the comments. Bonus points if it's in rhyming quatrain. What sets My Bloody Valentine apart from a lot of typical slashers of the time is its blue color setting. Up to this point, slashers had either been about college students, middle class babysitters, or kids on summer break helping out the inner city kids. Campers will mostly be like inner city children. By contrast, Valentine's Bluff is grimy and run down, but still proud. Everything's dirty, but it's a good kind of dirty, you know? One that leaves you feeling accomplished. 
It's not that different from the town that I grew up in, if you swap out mining for ranching. This leads to a funny anecdote about the town where this was shot. When the townspeople found out there was going to be a movie shot in their mine, they spent a lot of time and money cleaning the mine so it would look good when the camera crew arrived. When Mahalka and the producers arrived though, they were horrified because the reason they chose the mine was its authentic lived-in griminess. The producers had to spend thousands of dollars just to re-grime the mine. I swear to you, that's the exact plot of an episode of The Andy Griffith Show. Anyway, since none of these things exist in a vacuum, the blue collar town is also conservative and traditionally masculine, with no women allowed in the mines, and all of the men engaging in some homoerotic grab-assing, sometimes literally. Mahalka explains in the film's commentary track that a lot of this is based on hanging out with real miners. After risking your life for 10 hours in the mine, once you get out, all you want to do is have a beer and fool around and, and horseplay as much as possible. Of course, since I just said there were no women allowed in the mine, the first scene contradicts that with a beautiful blonde woman and her masked partner entering the mine at night for some kinky Canadian BDSM. Hey, do you think their safe word is poutine? Do you think the date consists of kinky sex and back bacon after? When they decided to hook up, do you think she said your place or mine? Whoa, don't touch her there, she's a miner. And of course, miner, I don't even know her. Okay, I'll stop. The woman gives the man a hose job, but he gets agitated and pushes her against the pickaxe, impaling her. Gonna be honest here, because I was like eight when I first saw this and because they never really follow up on the identity of the woman, I never processed until rewatching this recently that this is a canonical kill that takes place in the present day. I thought that this was just something that happened years ago or was establishing the mood. It doesn't feel connected to the rest of the film in some way, like the opening of Aqua Teen Hunger Force. The town is all a flutter about having the first Valentine's Day dance in 20 years, something we hear multiple times in the first 10 minutes. Well, the first Valentine's dance in 20 years. It's the first Valentine's dance in 20 years. It's gonna be a hot time on Saturday night! <laughs> Why hasn't there been a Valentine's Day dance in 20 years, you might ask? Well, it turns out in 1960, a couple of hosers who were supposed to be watching the methane levels cut out earlier to get a 2-4 and hit the dance. And an explosion caused some guys to get trapped in the mine. The lone survivor, Harry Warden, went insane and cannibalistic while he was stuck down there. The following year, Harry killed the mine supervisors who were responsible, cut out their hearts, stuffed them in Valentine's boxes, and sent them with a note that warned the town never to hold a Valentine's Day dance again. Now, somehow, Harry Warden returned. All of the miners are excited to get their freak on on Valentine's Day. We have T.J. Henniger, the son of the mayor and owner of the mine, Axel, played by future Simpsons animator Neil Affleck, Hollis, the man with the Molson muscle and mustache that just won't quit, Prankster Howard, because these days, baby, you gotta have a prankster. The dynamics between the miners are what drives the mystery, because this is a whodunit as well. Let me get my tea spilling hat on here. TJ used to go with Sarah, played by actress model Lori Hollier, who, by the way, is breathtaking in this movie. But TJ dumped Sarah to move out west to make his way in the world. We're never told how far out west or what TJ wanted to do. I like to think he moved to the peg to try his hand at modern dance, but it could be as simple as just moving to Berwick to run the local Timmies. What we do know is TJ landed right on his face like old Samuelson taking a hit from Dale Hunter. TJ came back with his tail between his legs, but now Sarah has moved on with Axel in his Canadian tuxedo. The problem is Sarah is still in love with TJ. He basically ghosted her, so she's hurt and confused, but she loves him and she doesn't love Axel. Axel was just there. Axel, on the other hand, knows this, and that's why he's so possessive of her and so rageful toward TJ. He loves Sarah. He knows that she's in love with TJ, and no one wants to be the Ralph Bellamy in this situation. Well, uh, uh, Bruce, uh, how is business out there? Any better? Well, Albany's a mighty good insurance town. Most people there take it out pretty early in life. Yeah, well, I can see why they would. And he knows how unfair all this is, because TJ was a selfish jerk for leaving in the first place, and he's upset, not just for himself, but because TJ hurt Sarah. And by the way, he never told Axel he was leaving, or where he was going, or what he was doing, and they're supposed to be friends, man! <sighs> this is all something that literary critic Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick refers to as the homosocial triangle. See, this is more notable in fiction than it is in reality, but it's by no means absent in reality. But male characters often rely on each other for camaraderie and form intense emotional bonds with one another. But, since those intimate relationships are heavily policed by heteronormativity, they have to be conducted through a conduit. A woman. And once you see this trope, you will not be able to unsee it. I'm not an owl! 
And the more macho and traditionally conservative you make the characters, like blue collar miners, the more they're gonna lean on the female character to express their emotions. All this seems to be an awkward point for the gossipy miners. No one really acknowledges it, it's sort of a beneath the surface thing. But there does seem to be some tension about the fact that, as the son of the mine owner, TJ was born on this town's version of third base. Or maybe he was born at the blue line? Does that, does that make more sense? Anyway, while the other guys are just happy to have the mine life, TJ running off to open up for Brian Adams or whatever he did, tells them he thinks that he's too good for it. All this is made explicit in the 2009 remake, with Jensen Ackles' Tom Hanniger returning to the town to sell the mine and put all the locals out of business. But here it's just undergirding the story. Like the character bio an actor would write to understand their motivation and play scenes in a certain way. TJ seems to resent the fact that he has to come back to the mine and see Sarah with Axel every day, even though his macho pride won't let him admit it. Not everyone is happy with the return of the Valentine's Day dance, though. Someone gives the mayor a human heart as a warning to stop the dance. That night, with the guys full of vinegar and moosehead, Happy, the ironically named bartender, recounts the tale of Harry Wharton to the crew. This perfectly demonstrates how much of life was an information desert prior to the internet, because if you would ask me in high school what happened in the early 1970s in the small town I grew up in, I would have no clue. Racism and gas shortage, I guess. But now this would be the equivalent of me giving you the history of the last season of Friends. Sit back, children, and I'll tell ye the tale of the remix to Ignition. I mean, since we're steeped in Marxist analysis here, I guess we can say Mark Fisher was right. Culture just stop sometime in the 1990s, and it's been a regurgitation ever since. Anyway, Happy tells them a story from when they were six years old, about him being the one to find Harry Warden needing his fellow miners to survive, and then Harry going on a revenge spree. And if they're smart, they'll heed the warning not to celebrate Valentine's Day. My favorite part of the scene, though, is the old piratey extra who just wanted a beer but has to wait through Harry yelling at these darn kids. He looks like he's the harbinger of another movie somewhere. Gonna go tell the Scottish kids in the next town about the Nook Levy. Of course Harry Warden, or a reasonable facsimile, is on the loose, slicing and dicing his way to your heart. And this is enough for the sheriff to cancel the dance out of an abundance of caution. Bummed, the miners and their honeys all agree to have a private party in the mine's rec space. Sarah finally has had enough of TJ and Axel, despite the jealousy of her friends. And in a nice little screenwriting trick, John Baird marries the A-plot and the B-plot through her frustration. Hey, how about a little trip down to the mine? It's 2,000 feet down. It's okay, I'll cheer her up anyway, come on. It's because she's so down that Hollis and Patty agree to take the party down to the mine itself. The third act is some classic slasher action, especially in the uncut version, marred only by the limitations of the lighting. But it's worth noting that the carnage was facilitated by the sheriff and the mayor, who gave the miners a cover story about Mabel having a heart attack instead of telling them how she really died. This is an interesting trope in early slasher movies, where the authority figures are often aware that something is wrong, but they keep it from the public. Sam Loomis does this in Halloween, only to realize that he made a mistake once the carnage hits. I still think I should notify the radio and television. No. If you do that, they'll see him on every street corner. They'll look for him in every house. So he tells the sheriff to do the exact opposite in the return of Michael Myers. But then that gets someone killed too. Shit, Earl. It's Ted Hollister. You dumb son of a bitch. You said you saw Myers. Certainly the miners would have been less likely to go into the mine where the evil miner had killed and eaten people if they were told that said miner was still hanging around that mine killing people. What we do see across horror though is this cliche of the authority figures trying to ensure that the general public doesn't become agitated. It's theoretically for the common good, but when you take a closer look, these kinds of secrets are almost always due to business or governmental interest and not for the public good. I don't want to close down my summer camp. We don't want to close the beaches. We don't want our corporate xenomorph destroyed. What, am I not going to build our new cookie cutter housing tract on a graveyard? You just mentioned that Harry's back, and this town won't be worth the powder to blow it to hell. This is what old man Chomsky is always ranting about. Whatever the reason, it's not actually Harry Warden doing the killings, it's Axel. Because as a young boy, Axel witnessed the real Harry Warden killing his father who was one of the mine supervisors who were responsible for the explosion in the first place. It doesn't make a lot of sense, and the remake tries to subvert expectations and somehow winds up making even less sense. Axel's motivation doesn't really matter here though, 
because as a film, My Bloody Valentine captures the vibe of folk legend probably better than any other film. The characters are just empty enough for people to get the brushstrokes, but relatable enough that the audience can easily do the heavy lifting on the love triangle. The plot is simple and covers all the bases. Within the film, diegetically, the tale of Harry Warden is told as a folk tale, even though the events really did happen within most of these people's lives. And that's understandable. Valentine's Bluff does not exactly look like a thriving metropolis. Big time coal tends to be mined out west, with tiny mines like the ones depicted here popping up in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. And in a lot of these tiny mining towns in eastern Canada and the United States, as the mine goes, so goes the town. A blast in the mine doesn't just endanger people's lives, it endangers their livelihoods, and the livelihoods of everyone around them. This constant state of existential crisis for the entire town leads to what sociologists and anthropologists, like Victor Turner, call liminality. I covered the concept of liminality in the Skinnamarink video, and that mostly referred to a spiritual and aesthetic sort of liminality, the empty space between two more well-defined categories. But Turner refers to it as a sort of cultural liminality. If liminality is that area between two states, then cultural liminality is that period of time between any one way of life and what it will evolve into. And that space between is typically uncomfortable, awkward, and scary. We see that in the US today with tensions between rural areas and the ever sprawling big cities. There's a reason that the Harry Warden of the story feels more like a supernatural boogeyman than the real guy from history. He's the collective fears of a town on the brink. A folktale like this allows a community experiencing this level of precarity to channel their socioeconomic and safety fears into a personification. Something defined instead of free-floating. It's the reason why the Harry Warden of the folktale sounds so much more evil and menacing than the real-life Harry Warden. The story of the real Harry Warden is just sad. Trapped in a mine due to someone else's selfishness and forced to feed on his best friends in order to survive? Driven insane by these events and understandably filled with rage towards those negligent bastards who caused the explosion? And then consigned to a mental institution where he died of presumably natural causes. I mean, sure, that's an okay cautionary tale, but it's not exactly cancel Valentine's Day forever scary. Everyone pouring their collective anxieties into this Harry Warden character binds them together as a community. That's why TJ's leaving, or attempting to leave, is treated as a betrayal by the crabs and the barrel guys and the crew. And it's why I've literally been standing here the whole time character Dave mentions his desire to leave in a passing whisper to his friend. Dave has maybe three lines in the whole movie before he gets drowned in hot dog water, and one of them is about wanting to get out of the town. Besides, I want to get out of this town pretty quick. Sure, screenwriter John Baird had to have Dave say something, but he chose that. None of the guys do much policing of it, except Axel. But there is this palpable, bittersweet feeling whenever TJ is among the guys and talks about his experience. Like there's schadenfreude for him thinking that he was better than the town. But there's also a kind of wistfulness, because if TJ can't do it, maybe none of them can. In the end, My Bloody Valentine hits differently for a lot of slasher fans, because it wears its class on its sleeve. These aren't middle-class kids spending their summer at camp. These aren't suburbanites kvetching about prom. These are salt-of-the-earth adults with real problems and not a lot on the horizon. So there's an authenticity to the characters that is lost in other slashers. It's a working-class tale about a liminal community clutching at the one thing that it does have, faced with the return of their collective boogeyman. Stay warm, stay safe, don't take any wooden loonies, return your shopping carts, make good choices, and I'll see you next time.